Exodus number one. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the, well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Thus ends the reading of God's word. When you think of strength, what do you think of? When you think of blessing, what do you think of? As I was walking in this morning, I saw a woman with lots of children coming into church. And I holding many things and the children holding many things. And, you know, my first thought was, poor woman. I didn't think, blessed woman. And I didn't, I certainly wasn't tempted to think, ah, here's the strongest person in this church. It's not what we're tempted to think. But strength and blessing, according to this passage, is associated with bearing children. Look at verse 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. They are strong. What, what, what do we usually think of when we think of strength? We, we think of wealth. Are they wealthy here? No. They're slaves. They're servants. When we think of of, of blessedness, we think of owning our own farm uh, in the Midwest or something. But do they own anything here? No. They're slaves. They're pilgrims. We, when our culture thinks of strength and blessedness, it, it thinks of, of diversity. That's not here. It thinks of ascendancy, political power. It's not here either. They're at the bottom rung of society. But they have strength and blessing according to the scripture. So much so that the man at the head of the most civilized nation on the earth at that time, 
is jealous, is envious of their strength and blessing. So what strength and blessing according to Scripture? Bearing children, being fruitful and multiplying. And as God's people do that, as they have uh, this strength, it inspires fear from pagan rulers. Why? Why? Why be afraid of your slave people? Why be afraid of these servants just because they really love each other and like to have a lot of children? Why is that so fear-inducing? Well, how do you respond when someone else is blessed? If you are always envious, envy is a clue that there's something wrong with you. When someone else is blessed, what does the scripture say that we should do? Rejoice with those who rejoice. But here, what does Pharaoh do? He fears. Why was he afraid? Well, he knew that this people group worshipped God. And he knew that he did not do that. That he wanted nothing to do with that. Surely at this time, he had heard something about this God. He will hear a lot more about it soon, or the Egyptians will. But they knew in their heart that they were God's enemies. And so they feared God's people. They knew that they were fundamentally not on the same side. And so they attempted oppression. How does that work out for Pharaoh? Is that a good strategy to do? When you're envious and afraid of somebody, if you have the power to oppress them, to tear them down, to try to even things up by force. And that's exactly what they did. But sometimes when people are oppressed, they get stronger. That's what happened here. They made, the Egyptians made God's people work as slaves. And over and over again, it says they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, there may be some case for servants from the scripture that can be made. But often, and in our nation's history, when someone is intent on slavery, ruthlessness is quick to follow. And that was the case here. Ruthless ruling out of fear. But... Even if this were to come to us, this came to God's people. What was the result? We'll see. But even if this kind of oppression came to us, enslavement, ruthless enslavement, we do not need to fear this kind of oppression. Was it successful for Pharaoh? No. We don't need to be afraid of it. Pharaoh, next, beyond ruthlessly enslaving, commands murder of babies. Of babies. Why does he command midwives and not his soldiers? He will command his soldiers later. But why does he start with them? Because tyrannical authority always wants to bring others down with it. And see if you will go along. If you see if you will be so impressed by their power and prestige that you will compromise as well. Beware. Beware you are most in danger. Because they might lift you up for a moment, but then they will cut you down too. They're willing to murder babies. What, what are they not willing to do? This is, we, we cry out against the scourge of abortion in our land, and rightly so. But this is far worse. This is outright killing of babies who are already born, and it's under compulsion. People in our land choose, sadly, to abort. Now, <laughs> there's compulsion involved, oftentimes, from the men, from family members. But here... It's very explicit. So this is a terrible thing. And yet, 
we should not fear even this kind of tyranny. There's nothing, it seems, off the table for this kind of tyranny, that it would kill babies like this, and yet we shouldn't fear it? No, we should not. And, and as you see this kind of leadership on, on earth at the highest echelons and are just uh, troubled by it, disturbed by it, appreciate God's leadership instead. It's so different. His leadership is a leadership of life, of encouraging life, of saying having children is strength and blessedness in life. Have them, have a way. A love of babies. Let the little children come to me instead of kill them. Our Lord has a love of women. We'll, we'll see in a moment. Pharaoh's command is sexist and racist. And yet our Lord loves women as well as men and every people group. The, or, We've read this story so many times that maybe we don't even uh, notice how, how sexist this is. Kill the men, leave the girls. And just with the Israelites. Of course he's not applying this across the board to the Egyptians. He's not saying, oh, we just got a population problem. Let's just let's be fair about it. No, of course not. Ty tyrannical leadership never does that. Don't be surprised by this kind of government and man. Don't be surprised by this kind of leadership and man. Whether it's at the state level, whether it's in the home. Don't be surprised by this, but appreciate instead how the Lord has far better leadership than this. How loving and gracious and truthful and wonderful is the Lord in his leadership. What's Pharaoh trying to do here? He's trying to take their weapons away. He's, he's happy to have all the Hebrew women that, that he wants in his harem, but, but kill the men. And this is a little bit strange because you'd think he'd want lots of strapping young men to work all of his projects like he's just talking about here. But no, that's, the, the work isn't the main thing for him. It's the oppression. It's, he's an enemy of God, and he knows these are people of God, and so he's acting out of that fear. Now look at the midwives who are honored for their godly response to tyranny. The Hebrew name for the book of Exodus is called names. It's the first word in Hebrew, names. And who is named here? The women are named here, and Pharaoh isn't. The greatest man of civilization at that time. We don't even know his name here, according to Scripture. That's not important. What's important is these two women's names, these two midwives' names. These are wonderful women of faith, like the Caleb and Joshua later of the Pentateuch. Here, the story starts out with female faithfulness, female godliness, and, and these are women who fear God even before Moses has had his call, even before the Ten Commandments. So this is God showing that he has been preserving a faithful remnant for him through Adam, through Abraham, up to this time. They know what godliness is. They know what it is to fear God. Even without the Ten Commandments, they know. And they Fear the Lord over man. No wonder Pharaoh is afraid. Even the women don't do what he says. And deal shrewdly with him to his face. He, you see, he's thought to deal shrewdly with them, but he got shrewdness more than he was bargaining for. Now, why did the women act in this way? Why did they say what they did to Pharaoh? They could have run away like Joseph and Mary did when there was threatening of baby killing. But as they stayed in their position, they preserved life. If they said, no, we're not going to do that, he'd say, okay, well, I'm on to my next plan immediately. 
They could have just told the truth, but being shrewd as they were, kept them in their position. And, and look at this, Pharaoh didn't kill them for lying or disobeying. This man was willing to kill innocent, as it were, babies who hadn't dis- dis- disobeyed him. But he doesn't kill these women. He, he, it seems he respects them. Why? Because they dealt shrewdly. And God blesses them. And he, all this, when they answer in a racist way, they say, oh, no, the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew women are, are, are much better at this than you Egyptian women. They say this to the tyrant who's killing their people. I wouldn't suggest that. That would not be my strategy. But because they have faith in a God who is over this king, they're bold to talk like that. And not in every situation, but at least in this situation, Pharaoh doesn't kill them. And they are proof that you can fear God instead of man and live to tell the tale. Too often people say, I must cave to this tyrannical authority. I don't have any choice. I have to do it. They hold all the power. They're the most powerful person. No, you don't have to. But this isn't uh, a happily ever after story. These women, these paragons of faith, follow the Lord in the face of tyranny and they live happily ever after. No. But the story isn't as dour as they, (laughs) they told Pharaoh no functionally and they died. It's not a simple story. This story gets worse and gets better at the same time. They're faithful to the Lord. He blesses them and gives them families. They're faithful to the Lord. Destruction comes to God's people anyway. This is what it looks like for God's people in the Exodus story to fear God rather than man. And this is what it looks like for you and I as we continue to fear God instead of man. Blessing and persecution will happen at the same time. Greater blessing for you as you fear God instead of man, deeper persecution for God's people. That they happen at the same time should not surprise us. This is a clue for the end times as well in your view of the end times. Blessing and persecution happen at the same time, more and more. So we come back to Pharaoh. What was he trying to do? He was trying to take their weapons away, the weapons, the the men of this, this people away from them. And our mind should go to another story. Jesus, the ultimate weapon that Satan tried to nip in the bud. This killing of children points us forward to the to Jesus' story, where Satan pressed his servants through Herod to kill the male children out of fear of the prophesied king. The story is recorded for us in Matthew 2, 16 through 18. And even there in that story, though Herod had all the power, Jesus wasn't killed. And the woman who hid him was commended, blessedness, blessedness, but many children died. Blessing, persecution happening at the same time to God's people. Don't expect to be teleported out of this persecution. Don't expect to get blessing any other way. So, dangerous, murderous power enshrined in government is not enough to stop God's kingdom, not in Exodus, not in Matthew, not now, not in the future. So, so side with the winning team. 
Come to Christ. This earth may have pomp and circumstance and power and pressure, but it's nothing compared to the Lord. And Jesus also is a power. He's a power coming to slay, like Pharaoh was, like Herod was. But he isn't motivated by weak fear. He's motivated by strong justice. And what he sets his mind to, he will accomplish. Turn to him now while there's still time. Be very afraid of his coming. Be so much more afraid of his coming than of all the threats of the most tyrannical world governments thrown together. Fear not him who can kill the body. Fear him who can kill the body and send the soul into hell. For the Lord Jesus will make the combined power of all the tyrants look like a puff of air compared to his staying power. So, it doesn't matter if the European Union doesn't even want to acknowledge their Christian ancestry at all. It doesn't matter if Christian professors are getting kicked out of public universities for their Christian faith. It doesn't matter if Christian after Christian is removed from their posts in our society. Evil will not win. Christianity will overcome because Christ has overcome. And when he comes again, he will bring recompense with him. Don't be afraid of the world and its threatenings. Don't compromise your consciousness, your conscience. The application is not, well, lie to a godless government whenever it's convenient. No. The application is, obey God rather than man. And people may still die. You may still be imprisoned. But do not compromise your conscience for the petty tyrants whose sun is setting. Know that neither the Old nor the New Testament teaches that absolute obedience to state, to husband, to father is necessary. Each authority is subject to God's authority. And there's a special application for godly women from this story. When men tell you to stop human life, When men tell you to obey them rather than God, fear God rather than man. God sees and he will bless even if that man spits curses and questions at you. And thanks be to God, we serve a king who is worthy of faithful servants like Shipra and Pua, a king who loves life, who blesses his people and shepherds them like a good shepherd whilst at the same time ruling over the rebellious with a rod of iron. Let's pray.